Nadav. As a matter of fact, if you go to the Temple University website, it doesn't even say doctor. It just says Nadav. <laughs> All right. So her expertise, she's Afrocentric theory, Diopian theory, African womanism, culture, curriculum, Africology, education. Nadav is a proud mother, grandmother and great grandmother. She has lived in Ghana. All right. Now, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Canada, the U.S., and the U.K. She graduated with a Ph.D. from the U.S. with a focus on African culture, women, and education, and has written articles, chapters, encyclopedic entries, and a book, African Mothers. Nadav is writing a book titled Culture, Patriarchy, and Race, The Demonization of Africa, Depending on when this bio was written, that book may either be in production or either is already written. Because in many instances, as I'm reading the bio, a lot of times the book that said they are writing is already now here with us. Her accomplishments include her involvement in developing African-centered and Afrocentric schools and education. She is currently teaching at Temple University in the Department of Africology and African-American studies in the College of Liberal Arts. I have an affinity for Temple University because my daughter is attending there, majoring in neuroscience. So uh, welcome to the Reading Circle Microphones, none other than Dr. Nod Dove. Dr. Dove, good morning. Good morning. Wonderful to be here. Thank you very much. It is wonderful to have you here. I already, and from the time I picked up the telephone and heard your voice. I love your accent. And you probably don't even think you have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> but I absolutely love the dialect and your accent and the tone of your voice. Good morning to you and, and welcome to the Reading Circle again. Thank you so much for rising early to join me this morning. You have just released, I believe, the, your latest book, because I know what I read in the bio, but I believe the, the latest book that you released is dealing with an Afrocentric curriculum. Yes, yes, you're right. It's called the Afrocentric School of Blueprint. And um, part of it is the theoretical reason and, and groundwork for the development of the curriculum. And then it's a blueprint in the sense that it's the foundation that one can work with to build a more curriculum with. So. Now, I don't know if, if Gianni or uh, Dr. Ayo Sakai, if they shared with you that I'm the principal of an all-male, a single-gender school, an all-male school that's predominantly African-American and Hispanic. How important is it, a book such as what you've just written in terms of schools, to have an Afrocentric curriculum available to them? I think that it's absolutely critical because um, I'm com coming from a cultural perspective, an Afrocentric cultural perspective, which means that um, people are different through their cultural beliefs and values. And when one grows up in uh, the US or in the UK or in uh, France, or Germany, one is learning the cultural beliefs and values of the people who have created those environments. So for an African person, an African-American person growing up, being culturally oriented to the values and beliefs of uh, the institutional structures um, run by the Culture, the dominant culture, an African-American child is not learning about herself or himself. And whatever she is learning is to maintain the control over her mind and actions in that particular um, cultural environment, in that particular society. So um, this curriculum and this book is really to show the things, the cultural beliefs and values of African people descended from Africa to look at those values and beliefs before conquest. So um, we are still a conquered people and our 
behaviours often represent the behaviours of the people who are in control of the materials that we look at and um, we copy those behaviours and ideas because we don't learn anything about ourselves. We don't actually know who we are, what our cultural legacy is. Um, and that really prevents us from developing our potential. Why are we here? Who are we? Where are we going? These things are not included in U.S. curriculum or any other uh, sort of European-oriented environment. You are absolutely correct. And as an educator... It's not. And that's why the particular school that I'm leading right now, it's, it's an intimate, small school just with the boys. And the predominant student base is African-American or Hispanic. And we're doing just that in terms of introducing uh, their history, their ancestry, why it matters, where they get. Because our story, as many would, would, would believe or don't believe, our story did not start with slavery. And yet, that's always the point where we always hear about. We don't go b what happened prior to slavery. And then when you start getting into uh, your ancestry in terms of what part, like for me, I've done the various ancestries.com. So I know on my dad's side, I'm from Guinea-Bissau. On my mom's side, I'm from Cameroon. Uh, but when I start talking this kind of language to many people, they look at me like I have three heads. <laughs> So how, how, again, knowing where you've come from, knowing who you are, because you're right, if, and, and, and there's, um, I'm trying to think of, I have to think of his name, because I always get him confused, it's not Joanza Kanjufu, it's, it's the other one, I have to think of his name, but he talks about how the dominant culture greatness is before them all the time, that everywhere they look, everywhere they turn, their greatness is before them. What you're doing here with this curriculum is, is giving educators and folks an opportunity to put our greatness in front of our folks as well. Absolutely. And it's filling in a huge gap of history and her story, the cultural history and her story of African people. Because if one looks at the needs of all children, actually, if we're going to be learning, a, a, a developing a a holistic understanding of humanity, we just can't have bits of it and the exclusion of our own humanity. And within this cultural environment that we're living in, African humanity is actually debased. So even if you go into um, the history of Africa, it's usually a false history. Correct. So this is... Yes, and, and this false history prevents us from coming together, actually, as African people. We're all divided in so many ways in terms of even different parts of Africa and different parts of Philadelphia, where I'm living. Um, you know, we're seen to, we're separated so that we don't understand our cultural unity or our cultural identity. And this is perfect to maintain control over our minds and our actions. That is correct. Matter of fact, the author I was trying to call, I don't know why, for some reason, his name always escaped me. I always get him mixed up with uh, Jawanza Kanjufu, but it's Dr. Naeem Akbar. Um, and Akbar Ooh. is the one that's saying in terms of dominant culture, greatness is, is, is before them all the time. As a matter of fact, the book is Breaking the Chains of Psychological Slavery and exactly what you just said in terms of the separation. That mm -hmm. that was by design, and unfortunately, too many of us, many too many of us, has bought into that plan, if you will. And one of the things mm -hmm. that you're doing as one of the things that you're doing as well, Mark, in your school, which I admire, and I don't know if you if you can um, tell people the name of it. There's a program that you do where your boys are actually dressed in African garb in the morning, and then you do the drummings, and you tell them the call and response and the affirmation. I think this is part of what, you, what you've done. It's the same type of thing that Dr. Dove is talking about, where you're implementing the culture from the grassroots level. Because like you said, you know, black people's culture did not start in 1619, right? There were seven dynasties in 
you know, across the African continent before, you know, we were enslaved. And the first thing they did was take away our culture, take away our language and break us apart. So what Dr. Duff is saying and what you've done with your boys in your school is a great connect, which is why this book is so important. It is. As a matter of fact, when I was downloading the slides, I almost sent them to my teachers yesterday or early, early in the week when I got them. I said, I'm going to hold off until the school year starts. But uh, to Dr. Ayo Sakai's point, in in my particular school and why a curriculum like yours is so important is we do start off our day with the drum beat. They hear the sound of the drum and they know that's when it's time to get busy. On any given day, I may walk up in there with a dashiki on or something (laughs) um, showing my Afrocentricity as well. But then, as I said, we do things such as libation. Like on Monday mornings, we did, uh, we had libation where the boys have an opportunity to come up and we pour the water in the plant and we say, ashe, ashe. Um, So they're learning about, you know, uh, rituals and routines that were a part of our African culture. And again, we go back into, uh, again, like I said, for me, I've done my research, so I know Cameroon and Guinea-Bissau and Nigeria. That's why as I was reading the bio and I saw Ghana and I was like, all right now. But many of our folks, going back to this psychological slavery, have no clue. And not only do they not have a clue, at this point, and Dr. Dove and Dr. Ayo Sakai, you all know, there's a fight going on for this kind of history not to be taught. Absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Dove, go ahead, Dr. Dove. <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Sakai, um, Dr. Ayo, um, I, I just briefly wanted to just thank you so much for um, believing in my work and publishing my work. And, um, you know, you've, you've been a great, um, well, friends, e- even as a publisher, in, in, on so many levels, and I just wanted to thank you, and uh, I wanted to thank Gianni for, you know, uh, investing in um, advertising or getting my work out there. This is a very difficult thing, and I want to say thank you to... Uh, uh, Dr. Asante for also encouraging me, believing in my work, having the theoretical perspective that I could use to understand what I'm doing and to put out there as I learn and grow. And thank you, Mark, for taking the time to uh, allow me to talk about my work. And also, you know, congratulations on your school because it's an example of what I'm trying to put out there. Absolutely. And it's so and it's so key and critical for and and for me, because I, I am a firm believer in terms of and, and, and this is not the this is the thing. Being pro black, if you will, or pro African American does not mean you're anti white. That's right. And that's what folks need to understand. And that's where I love about Akbar because he's saying, well, we need to promote us the same way the other groups promote themselves and and not be ashamed of it and not feel guilty and not feel anything other than the same right that you have to promote your greatness is the same right I have to promote my greatness. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, before I make my next comment, you know, like, uh, you know, Dr. Dove, you know, I fondly call her mother. Um, <laughs> you know, yes, she is a mom and a, and a grandmother and a great grandmother, but I, I feel so honored to be in her presence every day because, you know, she brings that nurturing and in trying to teach her children and her culture, I feel too that I am one of her students and one of her daughters and, and, you know, dear, I even, you know, you know, think that, but I am just so honored because in the African culture, what she brings by allowing me to call her mother as well is that in our culture, you know, we are all mothers. We're all aunties. When I was in Ghana, they, they refer to you as auntie, you know, our cousins. And in Jamaica, where I was born and raised, you know, it's the same thing. So I, I really love and appreciate Dr. Dove and, you know, to her point about Dr. Maleficati Asante, who, of course, is that the cusp of all of our men, mentorship you know he is the father of afrocentricity and to go back to what you were saying mark you know that's the basic foundation of what afrocentricity is and dr dove can speak more about that because she used that methodology and foundation in her book 
but it is talking about reclaiming our agency. It is saying that you do not have to be of one culture to be Afrocentric. You know, it's just saying that, you know, just like everybody else have the, the opportunity to claim their agency and the right to be themselves, you know, so does black people. And if you believe that you're Afrocentric and Dr. Duff can speak more towards that. Yes, thank you very much. I, uh, that, that is so true. And what I am um, trying to show in my book theoretically is that um, Africa is the birthplace of humanity. And, Absolutely. Um, yeah, so phenotypes uh, changed, um, but you can still uh, have African values and beliefs, but not necessarily look African, such as the First Nations people of this land who have been um, mistreated, murdered over the centuries. And, you know, we live on their land and we often don't remember that they existed because that's another feature of their cultural beliefs and values to omit the histories of the original people here and in other countries, but when you look at when you're looking at things from an Afrocentric cultural perspective, you can see that phenotypes may be different, but cultural values and beliefs may be the same. Uh, so you know, there's a belief in the uh, role of the woman the equal equality between the woman and man, the love of children, um, the respect for elders and libation and uh, music and spirituality. And there are certain commonalities in the institutions of First Nations people and African people. And there is some uh, history of this alliance which pose danger for those controlling everything, the controllers and, and dominators. Um, and uh, so that's always been separated as well. And it's been done by saying that these phenotypes are races and that they're very, very different and they've been put in a hierarchical order of race, something called race, which actually is not true. Correct. And in the hierarchical order, you have these phenotypes defined by the amount of melanin in their skin. So, you know, right at the bottom of this hierarchy is the blackest skinned person who is the most endangered person on the planet. Correct. And, and being oh. one of the darker skinned, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I'm one of the darker skinned. But I tell you what, as we're talking here, because many people will listen to us talking and think the curriculum would be just for black people. When the truth of the matter is Afrocentric curriculum can apply to children from all ethnic backgrounds. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if we're going to learn about our cultural history then we have to learn the truth about it and we have to go back before evolutionist theories and race theories and step outside the race paradigm, which we're all in. We live and die by race, even though it's a falsehood. And we have to go back to the origin, where we all come from, and then locate what happened in history to make us different and and it is a cultural difference. It's not a racial difference because race, in fact, if you look at the evolutionist um, belief, theory, um, pa paradigm, <coughs> um, the blackest skinned people are at the bottom of this structure. But the reality is that the blackest skinned people are those people who taught us um, the seven liberal arts who taught us, um, produced the first civilizations, the first stru social structures. And, uh, you know, this has been turned on its head. So if we look at that, for African people, evolution means going backwards in the race paradigm. But in reality... 
all humanity came from Africa, and if we we need to learn the story of humanity, period. So that's why the book can apply to any children because it starts from the beginning, but you can build upon it because it is a blueprint. Absolutely. In terms of now, we were just talking about it being for everybody because people really do get bent out of shape. And I don't know why, because any other group that does what they do for their group, nobody gets bent out of shape. But for some reason, whenever uh, African-Americans or some of the other, as you said, people of color groups do it, everybody kind of gets bent out of shape. But I understand it being academic. However, and especially now that we're in this pandemic and, and we're doing school remotely and a lot of parents have now decided to teach at home. I mean, I'm, <laughs> a lot of parents are saying, you know what, this is pretty good. I, I'd rather keep my kid at home now. Um <laughs> It's my understanding that this is these lesson plans and everything, they're accessible to parents and students. Anyone can get a, a hold of the in terms of the book, and they would be able to use them even if they were teaching at home? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, that's, you, the, the idea of the book, or one of the ideas, is to develop the, uh, such schools so you can just be in your sitting room, uh, you know, and, and use this curriculum to create an environment and bring other children in. These are the early, um, this is the early movement of the schools um, from the 60s, you know, the Council of Independent Black Institutions and the development of, of schools that challenge the, um, the dominant uh, government curriculum um, so, so it's about bringing that idea again because, you know, people will say, we've already done this, but then it goes out of fashion or then it gets ignored in, uh, information. But one has to keep on, um, trying to promote these ideas forever and ever because they're not going to be promoted usually by, the um, culture, dominant culture, because it's not in the interests of the dominant culture for us to know who we are, who we all are, because then we will see that our differences and um, are part of a fractured way of looking at humanity, and we can't come together on anything, and we're made to believe every day through all forms of media um, that in the race paradigm and that black people are inferior to white, yellow, red and brown people. We're made to, to view that as a cultural reality, but it's actually a culturally formed um, definition of, of humanity uh, within which African people are seen to be um, less than and even inhuman throughout the centuries, correct, and are treated in a in a particular way, as we can as we know. Um, but we're we're our minds are fashioned and framed by a cultural lie, and it's enforced through our minds. Yes, yeah. that and see that's why the school systems are so important, but also what you just said in terms of at home, we have to have the wherewithal as parents to be uh, sharing this with our children as well. Uh, it has to you. come both ways. Go ahead. Oh, and, and that's what I was going to say. That's part of the mission of Universal Right Publications as well, uwpbooks.com, is to make sure that our work directly correlates with what we're doing with our children in our schools Every single day, because we need to get this information out to the public. Because like you were saying, Mark, and what you were saying, Dr. Dove, a lot of people do not have this information. And if you want to teach your children from a black-centered ideology, from an Afrocentric ideology, and you don't know where to go to get this information, 
you don't know how to find this information. So now we do by going to a company like Universal Right Publications, you know, UWP Books, because we're publishing books that's telling you how to get this. And to that point, Dr. Nod Dove has a page, you know, if you go to our community page at uwpbooks.com slash community, you will see a deck that you can actually download to facilitate your classroom and your own schooling. It's a beginning platform for you to work from. And of course, you can always contact Dr. Dove or sending in information and, and do a blog, you know, and let us know how else we can work with you and help you. Like for you, Mark, in your schools as a principal and with your teachers, I mean, we are willing to find ways to facilitate that education because we do recognize that it's difficult to find out how to teach our children from an Afrocentric perspective and from a cultural perspective. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I'm looking through the curriculum, and and Dr. Dove, this is three decades worth of research from me doing my research on you. It's my understanding that this is three decades worth of research that you've done on this particular topic. That you know, Three decades, for those of you in the listening audience, that's 30 years. <laughs> so we're talking 30 years plus of research. Let's talk a little bit about that, Dr. Dove. Well, um, I did, uh, I, the, the book really is reflected of research that I was privileged to do in Ghana and, um, uh, um, and my mentor at that time was Dr. Augustine Argu and he was working for UNICEF. He was their educational director in Ghana. And he hired me and gave me the authority to develop uh, a baseline study looking at child upbringing practices uh, in the seven re- in seven regions in in Ghana. So I was privileged to train people from an Afrocentric perspective from and um, to readdress the sort of colonial conquest ideas that were defining who African people were. So I was able to turn it around and say, look, we are looking for the special ways that African people have developed, you know, the the institutional development, and we want to build upon them rather than destroy them, which at the time UNICEF was doing in Ghana. And... um, So the findings from there led to understanding what children were doing before birth until about nine or ten. So um, I used the findings to uh, as a foundation for uh, placing the curriculum in the book, so that children the expectations of children at particular ages are reflected in the book. Um, And I thought, well, what's wrong with that? I had over 800 families, you know, and we use Piaget um, throughout the world, really, the European world, to define what children are doing, their cognitive development. Dr. Dove? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I've got a, 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 a sort of call. I oh, okay, because I, was I, I wasn't sure if that was your phone or my phone, and I wasn't sure if I still had you or if I mine. lost you. Okay. Mine. <laughs> okay. Uh, he actually just used his five children, and the whole world uses that as a cognitive framework for developing curriculum, and I've actually used, like, an immediate family, so... No, absolutely right. As a matter of fact, I have the, the, the sample of the of the curriculum here, and I'm seeing here is broken out by people in life. That's the Afrocentric school lesson plans for ages three to five. Truth and ethics. The Afrocentric school lesson plans for ages five and six. Our ancestors. The Afrocentric school lesson plans for ages seven and eight. The myth of race. And this is for ages 11 and 12. Astronomy. We have the ancient Africans from K 
KMT developed astronomical Kemet. Kemet. That's what I thought it was. But I saw KMT. I wanted to be <laughs> which sure. Is, which is Kemet the name? developed astro ast astronomical knowledge from keeping records and the movements. See, this is the thing. Folks don't understand math and everything for the most part that we use actually was developed in Africa. I have the Afrocentric school lesson plans for ages 11 and 12, and I thought it was Kemet, but I wasn't sure. I just saw KMT. I read it as it was. The Afrocentric school lesson plans for ages 9 and 10 years old misappropriated discoveries. There again, there are so many inventions and discoveries that we never got credit for. Uh, mathematics, genius of African people is evident around the world. Science, mind and body. There's a plan here for ages 11 and 12, music and healing, six and seven years old, cultural identity, uh, the lesson plans for ages 13 and 14 years. The focus will be on colonization and the political movements in Africa to become independent from their colonial oppressors. And I'm just reading from the sample. But again, that is a well-rounded curriculum that addresses all of us. And addresses every facet of us. Well, thank you. And, you know, I, I have to mention that all this curriculum is put together with the ideas and the information and the great knowledge that we've received from people who have been trying to teach us these things, um, particularly african American. Um, who have been trying to teach us these things over the years. And so I've, you know, included their ideas in this to, in, within the lesson plan. So they are actually researched work by people like uh, uh, Anthony Browder, Chancellor Williams, um, uh, so many people, uh, you know, the great, the great uh, uh, Afrocentric people, people who are, are have participated in developing Afrocentric theory, the canon, um, because the th it's a theory, but the people that have contributed to developing that theory and paradigm, I have used their knowledge in this in this book. And it is grounded knowledge. And from this, their, their names, if you're not familiar with them, most people um, may not be familiar with them, but they can go and find these people and read their works and, and uh, see that this is grounded research so valuable that has been purposely excluded from us so that we almost have to be a, a sort of uh, seekers and searchers for all, for, to find any evidence of our existence. And so I've used these people, uh, um, their, their knowledge within this book. Now, see, this is the thing, because I've been on this quest for some years now myself, and what I'm finding is the more I learn, the more I learn of how much I don't know. right. <laughs> and in terms of just constantly learning information. And then you have this fight, as I alluded to earlier, of keeping this information. And because we've almost I'm going to ask you in a couple of minutes in terms of the changes that you've seen here in America over your time here on the face of the earth based on your age and things that you've seen come to pass and almost run full circle. But my sister and I and both of us are comedians, but we get a kick out of if you look at the show Jeopardy. The respondents or the contestants on there, if there's a category of African-American history, they will take nuclear physics before they take that. They, <laughs> they, they, will, they will take every other topic before. And then when they, whenever everything else is exhausted, then they'll take, OK, African-American history for 100. And then when they ask the question, every answer is Martin Luther King. <laughs> so <laughs> that just and, and I'm illustrating that in a comical fashion, so that just how little folks know about us or care to know about us and then within our own race like you just said we have to seek it out and therein lies part of the issue that too many of us are not willing to seek mm 
Well, it, 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 that's how culture works, you know, it informs and shapes people's minds so that they would do the bidding, they will believe the stories of those who have conquered us. So, you know, we, we really can't help it because unless we, if, if we rely on that information to identify ourselves, and mostly we're identifying as the black race, uh, you know, and behind that is the belief in the inferiority of the black race. So we're always trying to prove that we're human by being as European or as Arabic um, as we can be, you know. And within those cultures, African humanity is totally debased. So we have to accept this debasement um, psychologically, not really in the forefront of our thinking. And then when you, when you look at the conquest of Africa and African people, so much, so many heinous crimes have been committed that over the centuries, um, you know, we can go back 2000 years, um, you, you will find that we who, who exist today are linked to uh, uh, um, a cultural memory of pain and conquest and horrors that we we just don't look at. Then, then, but but they affect us psychologically and culturally to accept ways of thinking that innate that that say that allow us to think it's okay to be debased um, because that's there's a justification for it throughout the the, the cultural history. Um, the one that we're practicing, the one that we're living in, is saying that all the treatment, all the heinous crimes had to be done because we were monkeys or we were uncivilized barbarians or we were beasts. Um, you know, so that is all part of, of the the suggestions, the, the subtle um, features or in this culture, in this European culture where the, the, the doctrine is white supremacy, you know, that, that ultimately that is the major doctrine in this cultural belief system. And so we're all being framed and shaped to, to support that. Correct. Mm -hmm. You know, so so it, it, it's, it's not that we really mean to do this. It's just that knowledge is not available. And without knowledge, we can't know who we are. And that's what's happening to people who are believing in all of this and, and thoroughly um, sure that um, this is the truth that they're learning about. No, absolutely. In terms of what you were talking about centuries ago, thousands of years yeah. ago, in terms of the yeah. trauma, that trauma yeah. is still within our culture. Our DNA. That, right. That, that, yeah. that trauma is still there. And that's the thing. And, and again, going back to Dr. Akbar's book, Naeem's book, he says it's pretty much the same. That's why he's trying to get us to break those psychological chains. But they're still there. And to the point where in and I, I and, and this is up for debate for me, I have a strong position on this. But in my mind, we are the only group. And I know we've called it the N word and this, that and the other. But we are the only group that I know of that will take a term that was used to debase us and use it within our community and think it's cute. And I know, like I said, the debate is out there whether or not, because I know folks will tell me, well, it's not what you're called, it's what you answer to. I've heard all kinds of, well, I'm not really spelling it N-I-G-G-E-R, I'm spelling it N-I-G-G-A-H, I'm spelling it N-I-G-G-A. But at the same time, going back to what you were saying, when those terms were being used, it was because we were not seen as human beings. 
Right. And so, we've been, and, yeah, we're the only group I know that will take a term because when you get into the other ethnic groups, you don't hear them t- using their derogatory terms. Yo, what's up, my wop? What's up, my guinea? Yo, you don't hear that in these other other groups. You, hey, my wetback, how you doing? You don't hear the other groups doing that yet. Psychologically, as you just said, we've bought into this whole notion and then get angry when the other groups call us that. Mm-hmm. Well, the, it, 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 again, it's about domination. And, you know, if there's no alternative uh, knowledge or way of understanding who we are, we will participate in this because it's what we know. It's what we're told. And it's... it's um, you know, we we don't know about the idea of sound and about word, about nomo, that you can bring things into being through naming and through sound. Correct. You know, when, we, when we use those words, we actually don't know that they're um, a part of chaos. We, we, we don't know they're... The, the hatred that, that forms those types of words. So we're actually bringing into the world, we're, we're reifying um, uh, derogatory terms that have been used to debase us. But the only reason that we're doing that is because we don't know the beautiful terms, the beautiful stories, the beautiful her stories of women and men Throughout the centuries, you know, we've been browbeaten and and punished and killed, murdered over the centuries. So, you know, this is one of the. It, I just want to bring in briefly when I lived in the UK, how um, I grew up amongst uh, European poor families generally. And then when African people came into the UK, people of African descent from the Caribbean and from Africa, more and more, um, they, they arrived, as I arrived, with African behaviors and values and beliefs. And I was witness to small European kids telling their parents where to get off, kicking them and swearing at them. And over time... Whilst that part of it didn't really happen with the Caribbean and African communities that stayed in London, where um, what did happen was the behaviours. So the children, in order to prove themselves, um, behaved like European children. So what you see today, you can see that cultural transference of values and beliefs that are absolutely not African. And so, you know, the, the, you can see it. You can see it because if you go to Africa, um, if you're able, privileged to go there, and if you go to a European country w- where people are essentially, um, you know, poor, you will see that those behaviors, how they've transferred um, through, cu- through cultural beliefs and values. So, the black children, the black youth here are actually behaving like Europeans, but they don't know that. They think it's a black thing. And oh, right. That's why yeah, that's right. I, I, I'm sitting here because we have the mic buttons off and, and, and Dr. Ayo Sakai and I are sitting here just smiling and nodding heads at each other. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I went on vacation this year. Um, I went to see my aunt who lives in the Wilmington, North Carolina area, the Sunset Beach area. And I went to see my mom down in Louisville, Georgia. And in that North Carolina area, a lot of development has gone on down there in terms of housing. But a lot of the housing complexes were still named such and such plantation. (laughs) A lot of the complexes, the housing development still maintained the name, whatever it is, plantation. And I was telling my aunt, I said, there's no way in the world I would be buying any condo or any house or anything in something that's named plantation. But my point is the perpetuation, the efforts to continuously perpetuate, because that's all that is. There's no reason for that development to be named a plantation other than the perpetuation of we're trying, I mean, not for nothing. <laughs> and again, you know, I have to say what I have to say. Whenever um, our former president, our, our 
immediate past president was there with his slogan, uh, make America great again. That really was more or less saying, let's make America white again. That's pretty much what it was saying. Um, so it's this, this constant battle of, and I get it. I get power. I get economics. Those in power don't want to lose it. Those who are dominant want to remain dominant. I get that. But it's also up to us and it's incumbent upon us to start learning and teaching. And that's why a curriculum like yours is so important. Thank you. Um, you know, we should all be moving towards African values and beliefs before conquest. Uh, because we we have the evidence, we have the we can research, um, we can see cultural distinctions, and cultural distinctions are what make people different. You know, we we've, we've up until now always thought it was a genetic thing, but we're ninety nine point nine nine percent. 99.99. Can that happen? Point nine, anyway. <laughs> um, so the, our differences are, are culturally grounded. So, you know, it's the, the dominant culture wants to maintain its position by reminding us where we are in the race hierarchy. They want to do that. So it's, um, that's what happens. And when there is no knowledge available, we stay there because we can't understand that this is not true. Uh, and we live and die by it every day. People are dying across the world because of this belief. Absolutely. And, and now good news, because I don't want anybody to walk away, you know, from a pessimistic standpoint or view, <laughs> because more and more of us are becoming educated. And that's yeah, the good absolutely. thing that more and more over time are becoming educated and not just African-Americans, but others who are willing in general. For those of you in the listening audience, I hope you've been with me since six, but definitely hope you've been with me since seven as my guest is Dr. Na Dove. And we're talking about her latest book, The Afrocentric School, A Blueprint. And as a matter of fact, let me read that. Let me read what they have. The Afrocentric School, A Blueprint. Who were we? The book endeavors to answer that question. This handbook humbly offers idea based on ancient African principles that relate to the critical role of teaching our children. Grounded in the love of African humanity, women, men, girls, and boys, this handbook counters anti-African and anti-Black beliefs that have been propounded over centuries. The Afrocentric school recognizes a range of African culture values, beliefs, and behaviors that exist just as there are among the different peoples who conquered Africa. In this work, the cultural legacy and heritage of Africa is embraced to provide the knowledge that will reawaken the cultural memory. The handbook provides a foundational curriculum for children aged 3 to 15 years, and its standards are based upon expectations developed from a baseline study on child development and education. Now, this is the time... <clears throat> Excuse me. As an educator, I know this is the the foundational years. This is where if it's going to happen, it needs to happen if it's going to stick. So the fact that you've now written for that age group, ages three to 15, I applaud you. And any parents out there, I recommend and teachers, educators, I'm highly recommending that you get a copy of this book. You can order it from Universal Right Publications or any of the other fine book retailers or your independent book retailers or what have you. But I'm encouraging you to get a copy of this because in, in, in so many instances, our children don't know because we haven't taught them and we haven't taught them because we don't know. So uh, when you have books like this that come out that we're talking about this morning, please, by all means, please take advantage of it. Buying books is an investment, and it's an investment in yourself. So the book like we're discussing this morning, The Afrocentric School, A Blueprint by Na Dove, that's N-A-H-D-O-V-E, that's an investment in your children. That's an investment in all of our futures. Because, see, this is the thing. We talked about this earlier. It's not just for African-Americans. I got a kick out of whenever Juneteenth was now finally recognized. 
that caused so much confusion because the dominant group, our, my, my, my Caucasian brothers and sisters didn't know, should we celebrate that? Should we take off? Do we get off too? Or is that just a black thing? Or just are, are blacks the only ones who get a chance to get off? It, it caused so much confusion. And Juneteenth, what is that? So, you know, the fact that we're getting things like that and information out there like that is going to behoove all of us. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, you got too deep there for that, a that, second, that, right? that. That's absolutely right. Yes, that's, that's exactly right, Dr. Duff. Yes. <laughs> See, I get excited about this kind of stuff. All right, you're in my wheelhouse here. You're coming right down in my strike zone with this area. When we start talking uh, the mixture of education and curriculum and Afrocentric. Because that's exactly where I'm in terms of, unfortunately, so many of us don't know. But at the same time, in 2021, there's no reason for anybody to remain ignorant because there are so many means and resources really going back to what you were saying in terms of seeking it out. It's there. We just got to encourage folks to seek. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do with this book, The Afrocentric School, A Blueprint. Now, Dr. Dove's name is real easy. It's not like it's one that's, that's hard to pronounce. The first name is N-A-H, Na. And the last name is just like that peace bird, Dove, D-O-V-E. Na Dove, the Afrocentric school. What happens at this point, Dr. Dove, and, I, and I'll, I'll give you an opportunity as well. I'm going to turn the microphone off and... You all will have the opportunity to promote in any manner you choose. The only thing you cannot say is a dollar amount. Um, in terms of promoting websites, book signings, where you're going to be, how to get the book, you all can do that. I'm going to shut my mic off and you all can promote uh, for the next four to five minutes or so or however long you want to take to let folks know how they can get a hold of the Afrocentric School a Blueprint. Author Nod Dove, as well as others, that Dr. Iowa was talking earlier about from Universal Right Publications. So whichever you two can do it together, take one at a time, however you want to do it, but I'm going to turn my microphone off and you all can have at it. Thank you. Well, Thank you, Mark. Go ahead, Dr. Dove. Well, I think that you know more. Um, <laughs> than this area. You're an expert. You've um, been developing ideas and you're, publications for 16 years, is it? Or maybe 20? 17 years. 17 years, yes. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Delvin. Thank you so much for this amazing interview. You're absolutely brilliant. And Gianni and I were texting back and forth how amazing you are and how we wish we could sit into your class. And thank you so much, Mark, for this amazing opportunity. You are, as always, charismatic and brilliant and highly intelligent. And it's always fun to sit in the studio and talk with you. Um, As far as purchasing any of UWP books, including the Afrocentric Blueprint by Dr. Nod Dove, um, which was published this year, um, you can go to any of your favorite online bookstore. I mean, you could go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books a Million, you name it. However, Universal Right Publications would like to encourage you to purchase books from your local community black bookstore. And in order to do that, if you go to the link on the books, you will find a link called Indie Bound. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I think it's IndieBound.com. And it's I-N-D-I-B-O-U-N-D.com. And if you go there and you put in your zip code, you know, it will bring up your local black bookstores and you could order directly from them and you can um, and you can have it delivered. But of course, the books are available internationally in Japan, Germany, you name it. How are you know, universal right publication books are available internationally at your local bookstores and of course, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles and wherever books are sold. But we want you to remember that black bookstores are also endangered, much like Dr. Dove has said about the blackest people of this, of this in, um, global community. 
And we want to encourage you to support black bookstores um, and and find your local community bookstore to buy a book. And, of course, you can go on Universal Red Publications bookstores. We have a link called uh, UWP Booklist. And you can click on that and it will show you every single book that Universal Red Publications has published. And when you click on them, they will show you how to get to IndieBound as well as all your favorite online bookstores to purchase. I think I think I think I've I've you know said enough, Mark, and taken over your radio <laughs> show for enough. No, <laughs> no, that's fine. As a matter of fact, any, if you want to shout out anybody, I know you shouted out Gianni before, but if you want to shout them out again, feel free. Anybody you know that was listening, you want to shout out, feel free. Go ahead, Doctor Dove. Um, well, I I did send on the the show to my family. Um, and uh, so I, I just want to say I love you if you're listening, if you had time to listen. And thank you for giving me the strength to live, actually, because having children for me was <laughs> a reason to live. Mm-hmm. Um, because I had responsibility to try to produce the best people, the good people that would... Uh, you know, link up with all the other good people in the world. So that was my uh, reasoning. Um, And, uh, you know, so I've carried on through that. And so they are really my life and my good friends who believe in me and love me and hold me up through their energies and vibrations and thoughts and spirits. Uh, And uh, so I thank you all out there if you're listening and for those of you who are just listening learning and growing i'm i'm learning and growing too so thank you it's a privilege to be on this show and thank you thank you no it was a privilege to interview you now see again going back to our african traditions with our elders our elders And I know none of us don't know, but our elders are not going to be with us but for so much longer. And it is incumbent upon us to learn as much as we can while our elders are here. And that is an African tradition as well. So it was my honor and privilege to have an opportunity to talk to you. When I first picked up the phone this morning uh, and I talked to you for those couple of minutes before going on the air, I turned over to Io and said, oh, my God, she reminds me of if I was talking to my mom. Um, and, my, and, and my mom should be, God bless her, uh, God willing, in October will be 83. Oh, and man. so as I was talking to you, just hearing your tone and everything, I was like, oh, my God, I feel like I'm talking to my mom. And then when Io came on, she said the same thing. I was like, my mom. So there is something <laughs> there in terms of reaching, because my goal is to be 100 and healthy. I don't know what God's plans are, but my goal is to be 100 and healthy. There is something about becoming that elder you know, based on life and experiences and wisdom and so forth and so on. And shame on the younger, or those coming behind, not to take advantage of that. It's the gift of age. Isn't yeah, exactly. It, Mark? That's the gift exactly of age. right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, That's so, exactly right. so often we think that it's, you know, it's, a, you know, something to be afraid of to get older or to grow older. And we don't realize that so many people don't have died. That. So many right. people don't get that privilege. And it doesn't matter how much money you have, how, how accomplished you are, or how successful you are. Look at somebody like Kobe Bryant or right. even his young daughter. Right. who we lost along with him. I mean, he had everything, everything. And he did not get the privilege to grow older. So we know that grow, growing older is the gift of age. Absolutely. And, and we salute, salute and, and, you know, um, honor our elders. So, all right. With that being said, Dr. Dove, whatever you're going to do with the rest of the day, have a blessed day, week, rest of the life, year. Uh, But again, thank you so much for rising early. I do record the show and it will be on my YouTube channel. So for family members and friends who did not rise early with us, they can go back on my YouTube channel and they'll get a chance to hear the entire interview. All right. Most honored. Most honored. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoyed speaking with you. It was an honor and a privilege. Uh, Gianni, Dr. Io, Universal Right, everybody. Dr. Sante. Dr. Sante, thank you all <laughs> so much. And so that's going to conclude the interview for now. So again, uh, Dr. Dove, be blessed. All right. 
Take care now. Bye-bye now.